We're going to talk about why complex tachycardia. This is just a two hour CME. We're going to talk about how to identify it, what it is, what's the definitions of some of the things, and some of the things that we run into in the field that kind of make it hard to interpret this arrhythmia, specifically because we run into a lot of is it VTAC, is it SVT with an aberrancy, is it just a bundle branch block, there's electrolyte abnormalities, and this can be stressful, especially to new medics. So a couple of things that we're gonna talk about today are how to identify, give a key, quick, easy step, and a process to work through some difficult things in the field. But what we're gonna specifically cover today, VTAC, SVT with an aberrancy, bundle branch blocks, and then hyperkalemia. But why are we here today to talk about it is that this EKG comes up a lot and it's kind of difficult for a newer medic to work through the process of this and how did I even end up taking a 12 lead on an arrhythmia patient? But they get this and it doesn't necessarily give them the most confidence with it. And we kind of end up at this point of you looking like this while we're trying to interpret this arrhythmia and our patient is waiting for us to make the choice of what's going on, people are pressuring you from all different directions of how do we get this done, what is this? But also, why are these two EKGs different? That we base them off of this, it's a Y complex tachycardia. But why is one different and why is one something else? And why is one more dangerous? And why is one not as dangerous that we can treat with a little bit less of aggressivity? And why does it matter? Epidemiology wise that we talk about is that eight out of 10 of your wide complex tachycardias that present in the field or in any type of emergency setting are going to be VTAC. So we should have a lot of confidence with that. That we even, in the worst situation, the most common understanding is, is that eight out of 10 times, it's gonna be VTAC. There's too many things that predispose patients, hypertension, diabetes, previous cardiac events that make it this possible. But there is one case that produces a wide complex tachycardia that if we were to treat like an arrhythmia of that degree, we could do some really big damage. And it's electrolytes, specifically hyperkalemia. There's a cardiologist, and I believe he works out of UCLA, he talks about it as a swift kill. That if you misinterpret a wide complex tachycardia as a arrhythmia versus an electrolyte issue, if you treat the electrolyte issue like hyperkalemia, you treat it like VTAC, you are very easily put that patient into the box of unhelpable. Some quick reviews that we're gonna talk about though. Some habits to be broken. Hit the snapshot on our monitors. We have all gotten into the habit of taking a 12 lead and trying to base our arrhythmia interpretation off of a 12 lead. The most appropriate way would be to hit the snapshot on our monitors, get 20 seconds of uninterrupted arrhythmia interpretation, and at least that would give us a foundation of a good portion of a minute and say like, if there's any abnormalities in this arrhythmia, we could identify it with a 20 second strip. But arrhythmias do occasionally try to get diagnosed off of a 12 lead, and that's just not the most appropriate way to do it. Hit the snapshot, take a little bit of a longer strip of an arrhythmia and use that to help you diagnose, as well as identifying a hemodynamic status early. But what do I mean by that? Too often are we going on arrhythmia patients and we're hitting the blood pressure cuff button over and over and over again. It just times out and it times out and it times out. And we're seeing this marker of this hemodynamically unstable patient and we're waiting for a number to tell us what we should do. There are multiple things that we could do in lieu of that, taking manual blood pressure specifically. If your monitor times out once, we should be pulling out manual capabilities and using our physical assessment findings like no radio pulses, interpreting cool pill diaphoreses, early on in the event doing good primary assessments to help drive our treatment plan on these patients. But don't delay things for the ease of it. Automated blood pressures are great, but they are not definitive when in these emergency situations. Use your manual tools to help you get there quicker. SVT. So just a quick go back to paramedic school. SVT is one of seven arrhythmias that originate above the ventricles. And this is just a list of them. I know it's been a long time, or at least even for me, and I got to teach this course last semester, it had been a long time since I actually just looked at this list, and a lot of the ones that we forget are multifocal atrial tachycardia, that there are two versions of these AV nodal reentry SVTs. This is just a really quick definition of them and what the list looks like. But some common causes that we look at when we talk about SVT, these are four ones that are very common. They're the ones that we ask. 
Are you on caffeine? Did you overdose on some type of stimulant? Did you use cocaine to a degree? What type of thyroid disorder do you have? Do you have the low or do you have the high? And are you taking something that's regulating the high so that they can produce these SVTs? But the most common one that we don't talk about enough and that we only spend a little bit of time in paramedic school is the structural abnormality, the WPW. The one that is the most common reason for these patients to go into these SVTs, especially these fast SVTs, these ones that create this reentry circuit because it's an abnormality in their septum that separates the atria and the ventricles. Remember your WPW, especially in the presence of AFib. There's a reason we are contraindicated to give adenosine in the presence of AFib. It's because WPW is super hard to diagnose in the presence of fast AFibs. But if we give adenosine to an AFib that has WPW, we potentially send them into VTAC or VFib. They call that the ABCDs of AFib and WPW. VTAC, some things that we're gonna talk about with VTAC as soon as this pulls up. Definitions, this is just a copy and paste from the book I use at the college to teach this, but Usually when we talk about VTAC and where it originates, we say it's in the ventricle tissue of some type. It can occur in these other places, the Purkinje and the bundle branch blocks, but it's less common. It's more common for you to get some type of ischemic or infarct that produces this arrhythmia. Intracardiac and extracardiac causes, and it's cool to separate those things. It's not just a paramedic school conversation. It's an opportunity for us to really dive deep into why this is occurring. Extra cardiac causes, right? These electrolytes, these drugs, all the things that we're familiar with, but the ones that are more common, the myocardial infarction, the acute ischemic changes, and as well as in children, congenital heart defects. It's very uncommon for children to experience wide complex tachycardias, but when they do, it's usually because of a congenital heart defect, some type of hole in their heart someplace, somehow. Review of bundle branch blocks. The shoulders of the giants we stood on that came before us. Chief Avir taught ECG for a long period of time and the diagram that he always uses to talk about bundle branch blocks that I still use today is this turn signal method one. And the simplicity of it is if V1 is positive, it's a right bundle branch block. And if V1 is down, it's a left bundle branch block. It's that turn signal method of things he used to teach back not too long ago, but still holds true today. This is just a diagram of what bundle branch blocks look like. If one of your bundle branch blocks is blocked, it's gonna have to get depolarized from some other method is basically the uh, highlights of it. And that kind of leads us into what aberrancy is. So a common definition of aberrancy, again, a copy and paste definition of an aberrancy from a textbook or a resource on the internet is a supraventricular impulse that travels through the ventricles abnormally. So like in the presence of a bundle branch block, it does not travel its normal progression through the bundle branch blocks and through the Purkinje's. This would just be a copy and paste definition. Concordance and discordance. We kind of mix up these two when it comes to QRS and ST segment. When we talk about arrhythmias, what we're usually talking about is concordance of the QRS complexes or in the sense of bundle branch blocks when we talk about discordance, it's discordance of the ST segment. They are different and these terms are not used interchangeably and the visual representation of it is this. This is what we're talking about when it comes to arrhythmias. When there is negative, or negative concordance in the pericordial leads or the pericordial leads, it means the primary deflection of all of those six views is negative. Then if we had positive concordance, it would mean that all those primary deflections were positive. So there, it's not a discordancing, it's a, all these R waves are going the same direction for the most part. Some rhythm strips to kind of spark this conversation of some of the review that we just talked about. What is this? This is VTAC. And this patient still exists. And when I teach this at the college, I call this rhythm generator VTAC, that this is your most common version of it, that this patient still exists, that you're gonna show up to a cool, pale, diaphoretic patient who has this displayed on the monitor and it's gonna be an easy day. You're gonna know what you're gonna to have to do, whether you're gonna lead with amio or you're gonna lead with synchronized cardio version, but this patient still exists. But the whole point of this class is because of this version. 
what is this, right? Is it really wide? Is it actually discoordinates or concoordinates? I'm not 100% sure. This one is not as pleasing to the eye, that when we put them on the monitor, it's just not maybe as obvious the plan or the interpretation that we choose or what corners we're gonna take. So how do you recognize it? Well, there's a ton of criteria. There's Brugada criteria. There's table 6-1 from the paramedic book you used. And this table changes every single couple of years. Every time they update these books, Brugada criteria has nine steps now. This is the version from 1991. Then this table 6-1 is from the ECG book I got taught from at the college. And then I use an even different one. But the problem is, is that it's too hard to recall on a quick basis. So this is what ends up happening. Some version of this. So you don't want that to happen. So what do we do in the presence of this? We use this common term of make it firefighter proof. Chief complaint and age. We already asked this. But every study that I pulled references from this said that was your biggest indicator. If this person was experiencing a cardiac complaint and they were over the age of 35, their incidence of having true VTAC was so much higher, almost in the 90 percentile. How fast and wide is it really? Because we're going to talk about this inverse relationship. We're going to talk about what wide is and what really wide is. Because really wide, you should be scrutinizing overdoses and electrolytes. But when it's just wide, now we can be on the arrhythmia plan. Also, arrhythmias go fast. VTAC goes really fast. Hyper-K does not go fast. This one, AV disassociation. We're going to talk about it. We'll take some time to really dive deep into this one. And then AVR being positive, right? We should have 98% of our plan based off of that four lead, that really quick strip that drives our arrhythmia diagnosing. But if your patient is stable and you do get to the 12 lead because you need a, some confirmation in it, AVR can provide you some degree of stability in saying this is VTAC or this is a different type of arrhythmia. And this is just a follow up in those cases. Chest pain, age over 35, all these cardiac complaints, recent MI, chest pain or just cardiac complaints had the highest incidence of VTAC. Sub 150, this is a number that we did not choose. This is a number the AHA chose. That anything sub 150, start scrutinizing it as something different. But when it approaches that 150 and then takes off about it, it's usually some type of arrhythmia. That when we pass that mark, and we've all seen VTAC patients, they're always closer to the 300 mark. There's no question about it. But it's the ones that lay in that weird section of 160s to 180s that definitely occur. AV disassociation is a clinical feature of VTAC. It cannot occur in SVT. So when it is present, it is always VTAC. AVR being positive, we came out and we talked about AVR being positive, but it's also coupled with these negative deflections in one and AVL. Not something we necessarily have to confirm with it. AVR being positive is just the 90% of the equation. This is just the part that we didn't get to necessarily. So, some practice of what these four steps are gonna be. Because this is what I hope to teach in this class, is these four steps, is to use chief complaint and age, which we already ask, to say how fast and how wide is it, which we already do with rhythm interpretation. And then just to simply say, is there AV disassociation and is AVR positive? So chief complaint and age practice. My patient's 85 years old and has palpitations and a history of open heart surgery a week ago. Just hearing those things, and we get diagnosed to a heart problems and they have a fast radial pulse, what could we lean towards? We could lean VTAC. Now we get this person. I'm 28 years old, I have a history of cocaine abuse, and I haven't been taking my Graves disease medication. Maybe what do we lean towards on this person? Yep. Sorry, hit that too fast. But maybe we lean SVT. This, has a bigger picture, but just in those quick moments of just saying, how old and what's your chief complaint? Now I have a way to lean. Now we use this. Is it really fast and is it really wide? Because these have that inverse relationship. If it's really fast and just wide, so it's that 140 to 180 or 200 mark, this is the one that we scrutinize as arrhythmias. 
when the heart rate gets so fast, but it's not this huge, greater than one box, almost two boxes of width. This is the one we scrutinize as arrhythmias. But now we flip this relationship. Okay, it's fast. It's 110. So my heart rate's not super fast. But now my width is so great. 400 milliseconds, 450 milliseconds of a QRS width. We should scrutinize that as electrolytes. Again, this is just a visual representation. We did not choose the number 150 and your protocols didn't choose it. AHA chose it. They said after 150, it's usually an arrhythmia. It's not going to be fixed with positioning and fluids. And if you have those indications to, this would drive your treatment to giving antiarrhythmics of some sort. Is it really fast? The practice of this is using your 300 box method. Is every time that I do it, I just look for an R wave that falls really close to a line. And I know that the very next box using my 300 method is 300. So in this version, how close to a heart rate are we? Near 300 beats per minute. That's what VTAC does. VTAC does not sit in that 100 to 140 range. It sits in this 280 plus range. Now this one, is this really wide? This one's hard because it's that 140 to 150. We're approaching that, okay, it's, it's right there. But then I look at a QRS complex that looks crazy and it's 200 milliseconds or even more at some points. This is a TCA overdose. This person had a bottle of empty Elevil and presented all the ways of it and they treated it appropriately. But, I, but you should scrutinize this one as it's not a wide complex tachycardia that I'm going to shock. Because we know if we do it badly in this Elevil overdose, we send them into cardiac arrest. We should treat with sodium bicarbonate. But we scrutinized that it was greater than 200 milliseconds. AV disassociation. The, hopefully the term that you learned from today's class. Every material that I could pull from, this is a very recent lineup of how do we diagnose VTAC. They said it was the most important thing. Because again, you cannot have SVT and there be AV disassociation. If there is AV disassociation that we can truly identify P waves popping out on the top of these mounds that are not associated with an R wave or a QRS complex of any type, it is always VTAC. And even back in 91, when Brugada algorithm first came out, they said it had a, a sensitivity of 82% and its specificness to identify it was almost 100%. So it already had such a high success rate back in 1991 of saying that if they could appropriately diagnose AV disassociation, they were getting nine out of 10 of their patients correct on if it's VTAC or not. Now we move forward to 2022. And now we get new studies. They said here, and this is just an NCBI study that I pulled, is that when AV disassociation was present and correctly identified, it was 100% sensitive, 100% specific, and it was a 100% positive predictive value. So if we appropriately identify it, we get it right every single time. There's zero chances that it could be wrong. So what does it look like? It's this one. It's the one that's hard that you immediately look at and you're like, that's not rhythm generator VTAC. It's this one. It's these changes at the tops or the bases. It's these P waves trying to make it out. But the ventricular rate is so high, it is just overdriving the top of your heart. But it is not this smooth, rounded VTAC that said the ventricular response just overdrove it. These P waves are trying to make it out and trying to take over, they just can't do it. So we should scrutinize these mounds and the top of these hills not being completely even as potentially AV disassociation. Stream axis deviation, this is the, if your patient is stable, do we even get to the 12 lead if they're unstable? Zero chances that we're gonna even make it, right? If they're unstable, presenting with arrhythmia, we're usually treating them to some degree prior to that even happening. But now you get to that point. We look at AVR. What's AVR's deflection supposed to be normally? It's negative. 
Look at all these augmented leads, the negative to biphasic to positive as we go down those three augmented leads. AVR normally should be, or yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I apologize, AVR should be negative all the time. But if the ventricular ectopy is so great and it's causing this positive force and it's driving towards that right shoulder, it's gonna flip it positive. So when we have VTAC, like when the ventricular ectopy is driving force of the heart, we will flip AVR positive. You can confirm that with a positive negative deflection in one and AVL. I apologize, too many in AVF, I apologize. Having the negative deflection in these two leads just confirms your extreme axis deviation, but having the positive AVR says that my driving force is coming from down low because it should be negative. And in SVT, since the driving force is not coming from the ventricles, it'll still be negative. So even when you get that one, you're like, okay, I can get to a 12 lead. AVR is negative, we can lean that the positive force is coming from the top of the heart. <laughs> Quick review of the four things that we just talked about. What's our highest indicator to determine VTAC in the step one we always ask ourselves? Chief complaint in age, it's your biggest indicator. The next step of how fast and how wide is it really? Because we know that they have a direct relationship or an inverse relationship an inverse relationship. If it's very, very fast, but just moderately wide, we can scrutinize that as arrhythmias. Now we flip that relationship. It is scary wide, but not super fast. We should scrutinize that as electrolytes. AV disassociation. It works 100% of the time when correctly diagnosed. And then your last one, if your patient is stable enough to take that 12 lead and your AVR is positive, it can be scrutinized as VTAC because your driving force is coming from down low. Now let's apply it. First patient, 70 year old male with chest pressure that presents with this. Are we already leaning VTAC or SVT? VTAC, we're already leaning that. Then we get this on. It already looks pretty simple to us that have been doing this for a while. But again, a new medic, may not be the most obvious thing in the world. So is it really wide? I'd say no. And is it really fast? Absolutely, almost one box between these R waves. And is there AV disassociation? We've pretty much answered our question for this, but if we look, and I know this is a poor Google image, we can see some differencing at the top of these mounds, especially right here, this one particularly, and that one. So we could almost pick out and be scrutinizing of AV disassociation. So I'd say yes. We have already answered our question for us. But now, your patient comes back as a blood pressure of 140 over 70, and they are just moderately cool and diaphoretic. Are they stable or unstable, typically? Stable. So. We should trade our stable tachycardia protocol and then we can confirm these things with a 12 lead now. This is our 12 lead. What is that last diagnosing criteria we're looking for? AVR. Looking at AVR. Perfect. AVR is positive. So now we have confirmed all four steps and said this is a true VTAC in the presence of stability. We can treat as such. This patient, a patient we ran. 35 year old female feeling anxious. These anxious females is something to be scrutinizing of, period, end of story. Youngest true MI I've ever seen is 27 year old, one week postpartum. Her only complaint was, I feel anxious. So now we throw her on the four lead and this is what we see. And we're smart now because now we're hitting our snapshot. So this is what produces. We start to see this. And this is hard for anybody. Are you moving? Is the rig moving? Is the patient sitting still? All these things, it does not look good. But then you get a, just a moment of clarity where this is the thing that you're gonna say, okay, this is what I'm gonna base it off. This six second strip right here, this is what I'm gonna base my treatment plan off of. We already said she's 35 and she's feeling anxious. Where should we lean? 
we should lean VTAC because it's that 35 and above. It's, again, it's that marker of age. Okay, we are right at it. I know that might not necessarily mean a whole lot, but we're right at it. And she has a odd complaint and there's a female that presents differently. We know that. So we should lean towards the worst of arrhythmias. Now, is it really wide? I'd say it's right about 200 milliseconds. Is it really fast? Yeah, if we look at, at the top of these mounds, we're about, again, almost one box in duration from each other. Maybe just a little bit, so we definitely know we're in the 200s. That is definitely evident of an arrhythmia. And is there this AV disassociation that we're talking about? Yes. yes, absolutely. We can pick these out in these odd places where they don't look just 100% the same, but now we make her unstable. So are we gonna do a 12 lead? No. No, we're definitely not doing a 12 lead. We've already answered all the questions we need to ask ourselves we are not doing a 12 lead for this patient. So what's our treatment? We already know. <laughs> we synchronize cardiovert this patient and we always win when we provide electricity. Drugs can go backwards and forwards but I have yet to see electricity not work on a patient. Pacing, synchronized cardioversion, defibrillation, it is your definitive medicine. It's that Edison medicine. This person gets to get shocked and shocks into a sinus arrhythmia. And we save her. Now it's this section. This is the one that's hard to. Because you have a 60 year old male who has a ROSC. So which way should we be leaning if there's an arrhythmia? VTAC or SVT? VTAC. Just had the cardiac, just had it. This is your first rhythm strip. New medics running the call, just like every single cardiac arrest we go on. <sighs> stop moving the patient, right? Because all these things, stop moving the patient. The patient's sitting still on the ground. Okay, takes a deep breath. This is what I'm gonna base my, my treatment plan off of. Whew. Dang it, it's not perfect, right? It's not 100% perfect. So, in this situation, I didn't add any of the circles or anything. Is it really wide? No, it's not really wide, it's just wide enough. Is it really fast? Almost. Just, just fast enough. And they're post event. And now you've got captain on scene saying, that's VTAC, shock it. That's VTAC, shock it. Everybody's driving this force and you've been off your internship for two weeks. But what did you do when you got that spike in end title? You attach the 12 lead, you put on the blood pressure cuff, you did all of our raw stuff, you pulled the ITD. So you already had all that stuff on, said, okay, just cook a 12 lead, because for some reason that's gonna give you your answer. But in this case, it does. What do we notice about this that was not specific on the four lead? P waves in front of the QRS complexes. So if we had shocked this, is that a big miss? Especially to somebody that just had suffered a cardiac event? I'd say yes. They already don't have enough ATP to sustain a good heart rate and a good blood pressure. We should be supporting that with fluids and oxygen and transport and positioning. Taking that 15 seconds, which you are absolutely allotted to diagnose things. Not saying that this 12 lead was going to be the answer in every single situation. This was just a time it was because I was on this call. I got to see this conversation of the first four lead did not look good. It looks like VTAC. It looks like a wide complex tachycardia. They are post arrest. Everything is driving us that way, but we already had everything set up because we did our ROS task standard. We hit a button and it gave us the answer of being able to scrutinize these P waves in front of QRS complexes. If there is AV association, is it VTAC? No, it's actually 100% not VTAC because if we know if AV disassociation exists, it's 100% VTAC. This ends up being the repeat 12 lead as they start to transport. Uh, you can see the artifact and the bumping of the road. But what do you see to the rate? Did it decrease or did it increase? It decreased. 
fluid, oxygenation, positioning, and transport. They started to support what that heart needed. It didn't need to get shocked on top of everything. All those four things, pretty easily applicable in the field. But there's one time specifically that we could make a big miss, and it's in hyperkalemia. These are copy and paste from our protocols. What type of ECG changes are we going to expect with different levels of potassium? And these are all just from a book and referenced, and these are generalized terms that don't necessarily hold 100% value, but they do, for us, is a good thing to talk about. Some common causes, though, are kidney failure patients. It's the one that we, the growing cause that AHA says is the emerging cause of cardiac arrest the hyperkalemic patient, because how many dialysis centers do we have in Henderson, Nevada? Too many to count. And now we make that applicable to every large metropolitan area in the country. It is an emerging case of what's pending people into treatable cardiac arrest, is this kidney dysfunction. Acidosis, absolutely, so you get the person who's highly septic, cell breakdown like rhabdomyolysis, somebody who ran a marathon but maybe wasn't in shape to run a marathon, sends them to acute kidney failure, all the things that we're aware of. This is just a copy and paste from a pathophysiology textbook of our breakdown of how this works, but we know what, what it is, is that hydrogen and potassium like to hang out with each other so sodium doesn't want to come back and it just snowballs this effect downhill and we get worse. But when we have extracellular potassium, we can't pee it off because our kidneys are failing. EKG changes that you're familiar with, specifically the widening of your QRS and the bradycardia. Those are the ones our protocols say. It says, do not treat hyper-K until it is bradycardic and widened. Those are the ones that we're very aware of. We know that as the sine wave develops, that it is a high indication that it's hyperkalemia or TCA overdoses. But hyperkalemia can be fast too. They call it the slow VTAC. And when it gets fast, it actually carries the highest mortality rate of your hyperkalemic patients. It's almost 100% of a killer. So we are expecting this process of, oh, it's gonna get wider, 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 and it's gonna get slower, slower, slower. Then there's this rebound to going faster. And it will present, and it will look like VTAC. It'll look harsh, and it'll be hard to interpret. But if we treat it wrong, we get it wrong. This patient is just fast enough, right? So now we get the 60-year-old male who's at his dialysis center and is having that chest pressure and I don't feel good complaint. But we put it on here. Which way do we already lean? Because we're talking about arrhythmias, I have this chest pressure. Yeah, we're already leaning towards it's potentially VTAC. But now I use the other steps of this interpretation, this four-step interpretation of saying, is it really fast? Is this really fast? No, it's just barely over 100. And now how wide is it really? Identifying your markers to use your QRS complex, it nearly comes back 600 milliseconds. It's that inverse relationship. It's just fast, but it is very wide. We should scrutinize this. It is now off the table. We found them at a dialysis center, it's not VTAC because those two things are inversely related. The continuation of this is that we definitely don't want to shock this patient. They are in need of their ATP. You definitely don't want to give them amiodarone because that will, as we talk about pathophysiology, it puts them in the treatable cases of not treatable. That's why it's important that we get this one right. This is that cardiologist out of UCLA. He calls these the quick and easy kills. I believe it's UCLA he's out of, but he talks about this as a swift kill that when the QRS complex gets over that 200 milliseconds, maybe start looking at electrolytes. Because if we treat electrolyte issues like VTAC, we do them a disservice. Protocols currently say that if they are Brady wide and if they have suspected treatments, that second page of your protocols, it's in bold, then we can treat. Multiple ways to interpret this one, because it's not bradycardic, but there is suspected hyperkalemia. Always a good thing doctor is never a phone call away. You can always phone in and they will give you the confidence and the medical direction for that. This is just a review of that arrhythmia. It was fast, but it was very wide. It's that inverse relationship. The last thing, 
just remember a very easy four-step process to identify these wide complex tachycardias and to give you confidence to treat. Chief complaint in age, your highest indicator. We already leaned which way, we did a couple scenarios with that. How fast and how wide is it? They have that inverse relationship. Very, very fast and just wide enough, rhythmias. Too wide and not fast enough, those electrolytes and those overdoses. AV disassociation, if you can correctly identify it, it is 100% accurate. Then if your patient was stable enough and you got the 12 lead, AVR is positive, that driving force comes from the low part of your ventricles and flips that R wave positive, helping you identify VTAC. Thank you for your time.